Really excited to turn it over to Dr. Jingren now to talk a, a bit more about some considerations uh, of using IMRT in the clinical setting. All right, so I am going to talk about pros and cons of IMRT, and I didn't realize that some of the trials are going to be discussed later, but I am going to discuss one trial for sure while we're talking about this. I'm actually going to use gynecological cancers as an example to talk about the pros and cons of IMRT. So, and I think it's a perfect area to look at it because it's so complex. So we can really talk about what are the pros and cons of IMRT using this. So gynecological cancers will be my main uh, area where we talk about it, but it can be used for anything. So why are we talking about IMRT? Why is radiation changing? So in gynecological cancer, so this is data actually from cervix. And this is actually was this is actually old data, but it's still relevant even now. So this is um, pa intact patients, cervix cancer patients who were treated with definitive radiation therapy. So close to 3,000 patients. So at 10 years, the Late toxicity is in rectal 3.3%, sigmoid is 0.2, small bowel is 4.2, bladder is 3.0, all type is 11.8. I mean, sorry, 11, about 11%. 11 so radiation therapy does cause toxicity. So that is really what we're looking at, and this is why, where IMRT really comes in. So again, in GYN cancers, and like I said, I'm just using this as an example, and this is true for all sites. Radiation works really well in controlling the disease, but we do to cause toxicities, right? So this is actually an endometrial cancer patient. So it's post-op. These patients were treated with observation versus pelvic radiation therapy. This was PROTEC-1. So what did we find? We found that there was a 26% complication rate at five years with patients who were treated with radiation therapy versus 4% in the control group. Great three to four, three percent in the radiation therapy group, zero percent in the um, control group, 67 percent grade one. So these were toxicities that these patients were living with for the rest of their lives. And really interesting what they did, so in PROTECT-1, we didn't have IMRT, so they actually looked at the way these patients were treated, other APPA or box. As you can see, APPA had higher toxicity than box did, and other had more, and that could be just anything, but the key is, I think, to look at APPA definitely had more toxicity than box. And so the conclusion was, with a median follow-up of 13 years, patients who received radiation therapy felt worse than the patients who had observation. They had a higher rate of urinary incontinence, diarrhea, and fecal leakage. And last, last trial that looked at toxicity, I think it was also just as important, was looking at pelvic radiation therapy versus observation, so PROTECT-2. And this is just so important. Patients who got pelvic radiation therapy had a higher incidence of late diarrhea, fecal leakage, limitation in daily activities, and the need to remain close to the toilet. So pelvic radiation therapy does cause toxicity, just like radiation therapy to the head and neck causes toxicity. Radiation therapy to anything does cause toxicity, and this is where IMRT comes in. The other thing where, the other toxicity that is actually relevant is pelvic fractures. There's also a high incidence of pelvic fractures, especially when we make our patients postmenopausal. So again, this is where IMRT comes in. This is where IMRT is so important. And I will show you the data on how it really does help. But as I showed you, regular 3D or 2D radiation therapy does have toxicities. We're doing great in controlling our cancer, but we have our toxicities. So how can we improve IMRT? So what does IMRT do? It can improve oncological outcomes, there's a lot of data shows that we can dose escalate, but whether it improves oncological outcomes, there probably is very little. I'm going to show a little bit of this, and again, you're going to have a talk on this at the end. What it does do is it re reduces radiation to normal tissue, which can decrease toxicity. 
And with IMRT, you can expand the indication of radiation therapy. So you could do it for retreatments, you can do it for augment metastatic disease. But the key is it reduces dose to normal tissue so we can reduce toxicity. So pelvic, so just look at the pelvis. And this could be for rectal, this could be for anal, this could be for prostate, right? So here's a 3D conformal plan. And I know you guys all know this, but I'm just gonna show you this anyway. So here's a 3D conformal plan, right? So we're treating all this bowel to a full dose, right? IMRT, what does it do? It reduces that dose to the bowel, right? So it reduces dose to the normal tissue. It also actually will reduce dose to the bone. So we do have data. IMRT 100% reduces dose to bowel. And we actually had phase two studies as well as retrospective studies that showed using IMRT over 3D conformal, we had decreased GI toxicity. RTOG 0418 was a phase two study, and we definitely had decreased both early and late GI toxicity using IMRT. It can also probably reduce, as we talked about, dose of the bowel, which could probably reduce hematological toxicity. This is just a study showing if you do outline the bone marrow, even if you don't outline the bone marrow, IMRT does reduce dose to the bone and can reduce dose to the bone marrow. So based on those studies, IMRT really does help reduce dose to normal tissue, which will reduce normal toxicity, right? But there are other issues with it. So we're gonna come back to that. So we're gonna come back in a minute. But let's talk about probably the one really important study, at least in GYN. And I know people are gonna talk about this again, but I just wanna talk about this study. So this was a randomized study in GYN cancer, so cervix or endometrial, all post-op. And the patients were randomized to 3D conformal or IMRT. Local control, disease-free survival and overall survival, the same between the two arms. So there's no difference. So IMRT did not improve overall survival, right? So, but it also didn't reduce overall survival. So IMRT for a field equivalent in local control, disease-free survival and overall survival. But what IMRT did is show a decrease in toxicity. And the cool thing about this trial is that it actually looked at patient reported toxicity. So this is actually what patients reported, not what physicians reported. And what they found that IMRT decreased acute GI toxicity. So at five weeks, patients who received IMRT had less GI toxicity than patients who received 3D conformal. And in fact, patients who received IMRT reported less diarrhea. They took less Imodium. So patients who got IMRT had less acute toxicity, but they also had it, if you can see, early, but also late. So in one year, post-treatment, patients who got IMRT had less diarrhea than patients who got 3D conformal. So even late toxicity was reduced by IMRT. And just you can see the medications, again, at one year, huge difference. By three years, it, equivalent, it, it evened out, but at one year, there was still a difference in patient-reported diarrhea. But what's interesting also, fecal incontinence, early acute fecal intolerance was, um, sorry, incontinence was reduced by IMRT. But very interestingly, IMRT also reduced urinary symptoms at five weeks and three years post-op, which we didn't expect, right? Because the retrospective data and the phase two data did not show it. But this study did show a decrease in urinary toxicities week three, week five, and even three years post-treatment. So what you can see right here, so IMRT really does decrease toxicity. And the patients who received IMRT actually had a better FACT score. So in conclusion, for this study, and this is actually a really relevant study for GYN, but again, 
its pelvis, right? So it can be used for rectal, it can be used for prostate, it could be used for anything where you're treating the pelvis, right? 3D, so in comparison to 3D conformal, IMRT reduced patient reported acute GI toxicity as well as late GI toxicity. Key, it reduced acute urinary and late toxicity. So that's where IMRT comes in. That is the biggest advantage of IMRT. It will reduce your side effects. So you're curing, but then you're also reducing the side effects of these patients that are living longer because you've cured their cancer. So yay, IMRT is great, right? So we should be using IMRT for everybody. What are the limitations? So there are a lot of limitations to IMRT. And this is really, I think, the most important part of this talk because you've got to know the limitation. And again, I'm gonna use GYN as my source, but realize that this is for any part of the body, right? Key, organ motion and tumor regression. Tumor regression is so important in head and neck, right? The tumor will regress very quickly. What happens if your tumor regresses? Your normal tissues come in and will get the higher dose. So these are important things that you have to think about when you're doing IMRT. Accurate target deletion. This is where it really is a steep learning curve, especially for physicians. If you don't, if you don't contour collect correctly, you'll miss the target, you'll miss treating the disease. So it's very, very important. Also, there are a few clinical outcome and toxicity studies, and I'm gonna show you some, okay? But the big thing is, and it's really important for you to think about, how much of the improvement is at risk for losing control, right? And you've got to think about that. So let's look at limitations and consideration, organ motion. So this is again for GYN, but remember this is relevant for prostate, it's relevant for anything. But for intact cervix, okay, I just wanna show you some slides which are really interesting and I need you to realize how much organ does move, right? So this is a patient with an intact cervix. You can see the seeds, see here are the seeds? The seeds are put in the cervix, at, you know, so we put seeds in. So this is a image that we take daily while we're treating a patient with IMRT. So here's the seed, right? And here's the cervix. Wow, look. So here's the rectum coming in. There's a gas bubble. What did it do? It pushed my, seat, my cervix anteriorly, right? Here, and so you can see the difference. Here was my original seat cervix, and here's my cervix now, right, with this gas bubble. So organ motion is really important, whether it's prostate, whether it's any other part of your body, like stomach, right? If you're treating stomach, you've got to make sure, you, you know, are you gonna be treating with an empty stomach? Or are you gonna be treating with a full stomach? Because that changes what you're treating. So it's not just pelvis, it's anywhere in your body. Like, so for stomach cancer, we do empty. So they have to be MPO three to six hours before we treat them so that we have a cons consistent filling of the stomach. So it's really important to know that your, your tumor is gonna be moving depending on organ. I get another example. So not just rectal, right? So here's your uterus, very pretty. Here it is, same can patient, same pa sorry, same patient, empty bladder. So my uterus goes down here and now my bowel probably is in my field. If you look, so here, if I did full bladder and if I knew it was always full, I'm missing all my bladder. But if I go here, if it's empty, that bowel, I mean, I'm sorry, the I miss all my bowel. If I treat with an empty, all that bowel comes in, right? So it really moves depending on both rectal filling and bladder filling. So you have to know how much margin to put in or whether you're gonna treat with empty or full bladder. I mean, huge difference, right? Here, there's no bowel. Here's there's bowel. And, and you just have to know what you're treating and how you're gonna treat. Also, I mean, we do know even the vagina, post-op vagina can move up to two CMs depending on bladder and rectal filling. This just is an ITV of a vagina that we did with empty bladder and full bladder, empty rectum and full rectum. And this is how much it moved during those two different steps. So it really can move and it's so important that you know what that organ motion is. Again, just another example and it just shows you more clearly, right? Empty rectum, 
full rectum. Look how much of the vagina moved, right? You're totally missing it. So if you contoured only on a CT with an empty rectum, you would move, miss the vagina the next day if the rectum was full. So it's just so important to know what we do at MD Anderson is we actually will do a ITV. So we do a scan with a full bladder and a scan with an empty bladder. If somebody has a rectum like this, right, we will actually take the gas out and then re-simulate. But we do do daily CTs to make sure that somebody doesn't have a rectal filling like this, because if they have a rectal filling like this, we'll actually have them get off the table and empty their rectum and their bladder and then, re and then treat, right? But you can see, the other thing you could do is just make the margins bigger, right? So you could account for the fact that this is an empty rectum and may, have made the PTV bigger so that you accounted for just in case something like this happened. But it is really important to account for organ filling. That's really relevant. But the other thing that's important, especially in head and neck, but as well as in cervical cancer or any other area that you treat, is tumor response. And again, I'm gonna again I'm gonna show I'm gonna show it to you because because this is it's the same, right? So we actually did a study and we did CT scans on patients with intact cervix, okay? So the green is the original CT that we started off with. So that was, so we did green and that was with the full bladder, right? And as tumor regressed and we took weekly CTs, you can see how the tumor is regressing and by the fourth week of treatment, this is her cervical cancer now, right? And we really, the biggest response was by four weeks. So this is just weekly thing. So think about it. If you had planned this case based on this, right? As the tumor is regressing, what's happening? Your bladder and your rectum are coming into the area of the highest dose, right? So then that bladder and rectum that you thought was safe is getting full dose. So it's really important to think about tumor regression. Now, it's more important actually, in, not in cervix as it is in head and neck, right? Because as your head and neck cancers shrink, that parotid that you thought that you're saving is coming into that high dose. So your question is whether you should be doing adaptive planning based on your CTs. And in fact, what we did find in intact cervix, 16 patients, there was a change. So we started off with the mean cervical volume of 97 cc's and we ended up with the mean cervical volume of 32 cc's. There was a reduction of 62% no matter what the stage was and the medium change was in 20 days. So it really is an intact cervix, this tumor response, as you can see, as the tumor shrinks, the normal tissue is gonna come in. It's really relevant in head and neck not as much in cervix because the bladder and the rectum can tolerate that 45 gray that you're giving, right? And in head and neck, the parotid can't. So what about another case? So let's just talk about vulvar, okay? Traditionally, we were treating vulvar cancers with these huge fields, right? That APPA that treated the entire field, treated the groins, it treated the femoral heads, it treated everything. The advantage was we were treating everything so we could not miss tumor. The disadvantage was we were treating everything. So we were treating all the skin that didn't need to be treated. We were treating the femoral heads. We were treating the femoral necks, right? So we had high fractures. We had diarrhea. We had a lot of issues. And in fact, you can see, so this is a lady who actually was treated with a big field, right? Huge diarrhea. All of this is scarring from the radiation. So this is what she's had to live with after we got done. So because we treated, we treated the thigh, we treated all, so you can see even the bottom thighs, we treated so much of this area because we treated this big field. But the advantage was we didn't miss, right, at all. And she's cured but she's having to live with these toxicities. She has chronic diarrhea. She has these irritations that itch and burn and she has a little bit of swelling of the legs. 
And you can see, right, this is 12 years later. She still has all of the skin toxicity that just drives her crazy. But we treated all that, but again, she's cured. So I mean, what are we gonna say? 12 years later, she's cured. But how can we do, how can we improve on that? IMRT. The advantage of IMRT with bulbar cancer, as it's an anal cancer, right? This has become the treatment for anal cancer. <laughs> Sorry. Okay. We're using IMRT for anal cancer for the same reason. We can protect the anus. Well, in anal cancer, you're not, but you're protecting the vagina in anal cancer. For vulvar cancer, you can protect the anus. You can protect skin outside of the PTV. You can protect the central bowel, which is really important. Like even in anal cancer, very important. Key, we can protect the femoral heads and neck, right? So we can definitely reduce these fractures in these really older patients who have both, you know, either anal or vulval cancer. The other thing with IMRT, which I'm not going to talk a whole lot about, but the big advantage of IMRT is you can also give a little bit higher dose to the positive disease while giving lower dose to the normal tissue. And the clinically microscopic disease, right? So here we're giving close to, where we're giving like 2.2 gray to the positive node while taking this groin at two gray and while taking the vagina at 1.8 gray. See, the other thing with IMRT is you can change dosing to different parts of the body, which is really important, right? So you can dose paint. But I think the biggest advantage of IMRT is you can protect normal tissue, right? But the key and the disadvantage, again, in vulvar cancer is the same thing as any other IMRT we do. Very steep learning curve. There's also a lot of controversies on what to treat, how much of the vagina to treat. When you were treating the big field, you were treating all the vagina. So you didn't have to worry about this. You were treating the mons. You didn't have to worry about this. So the question is now, do we really need to treat all the vagina? Do we really need to treat all the mons? How much of it really does need to be treated? And how do we optimize everything? The other thing is patient movement, right? And you've got to know this. You gotta know and make sure that the patient is setting up the same. And that's where IGRT really comes in. And I'm gonna talk a little bit more about that because, and we'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute, but you know, you've got to have the setup pretty good. You can see if, if you're not, the patient's gonna miss the disease completely, right? But remember the case I showed you before, how much skin toxicity that patient had, right? This is a lady that was treated with IMRT, seven years out. She's NED, but you can see, look how pretty, as pretty as it can be, right? <laughs> but you can see how pretty her skin is on the outside, right? Because we spared the thigh, we spared the anus, we spared all of the dose to this area with IMRT. So she doesn't have that skin toxicity that the patient did when we used APPA feels, right? Yeah, she has a little bit here because that's where we took the dose a little bit higher, but on the outside, much, much better. She's fully continent, has no issue. She does have mild lymphedema where she had the node, right? The node dissection, but otherwise, she's really, really doing great. Mild rectal irritation treated with dietary fiber. So we reduce the late toxicities. We reduce the late skin toxicity, and we reduce the late GI toxicity. So this is where IMRT really comes in. So let's talk about head and neck. So in head and neck, there's a meta-analysis that shows that IMRT allows for better response and overall survival in patients with nas nasopharyngeal cancers. That's the only air cancer where IMRT actually showed over improvement in overall survival in head and neck. And it, it is recommended technique for locally advanced nasopharyngeal and sinonasal tumors. But where IMRT is really important in the head and neck, and this is the key, IMRT reduces xerostomia, okay? That is why we're using IMRT in the head and neck. It isn't because, besides the nasopharynx, right? And the nasopharynx is the only site that we have shown that IMRT improves overall survival. Key, that's, that's IMRT, yes, sorry. Okay, IMRT reduces xerostomia and it may help with risk of reduction of grade two acute xerostomia. 
The other advantage of IMRT is it allows for re radiation and possibly abrasion therapy to ogolo mets. So what are the limitations of IMRT in head and neck? Okay, so the limitations are we are now spreading low dose to a lot of areas that we didn't think about before. So now actually there are new toxicities that we have to be aware of, including anterior oral mucositis, scalp hair loss, headaches, nausea, vomiting, irritation to irritation to the small part of the brain stem. And actually what's really interesting is that patients who received IMRT have, for head and neck cancer have more fatigue. So we are seeing new toxicity because what IMRT does that three field doesn't do is it actually spreads low dose to a lot more areas than we, than, than we thought, right? So it is important to look, there are advantages to IMRT, right? But there are some disadvantages too, which we talked about. One is it does spread low dose. So the question is, will it increase secondary malignancies? So far the data shows it doesn't, but we have to be aware of that. But key, look at this. It does increase new toxicities because of this low dose. But the most important thing, and this is where I brought it up, is if you are going to do IMRT, you have to do daily image guided radiation therapy. Whether it's KV, whether it's comb beam, whether it's MRI, but you've got to do that because you've got to look at your organs. You've got to look at your, what the bladder and rectal filling is doing. Where is, you know, how much regression of the tumor do you have? And if you have that regression, do you need to replant, right? Is my normal tissue back in that field? The other thing is you just got to make sure the patient's lining up. And if you can make sure and you do this daily IGRT, you can probably reduce your PTB and also then reduce your um, side effects, right? So it's really important. What it does is that it monitors changes in shape and position of both target volumes and normal tissues. And maybe, you know, we can add adaptive planning. There's no data that it shows that it improves overall survival or local control or even side effects. But with the use of IMRT and IGT, IGRT, we can start thinking about adaptive planning, right? So in prostate cancer, what does IMRT do? It significantly reduces GI toxicities compared to 3D conformal, 13% versus 5%. A couple of other studies have also shown that IMRT really does reduce GI toxicity compared to 3D conformal. So you can increase your dose, whether you use 3D conformal or IMRT. The advantage of IMRT is that it does reduce your GI toxicity. This is just a, a table. And this, I mean, so this is the table that's most of the studies that shows what the advantage of IMRT is over 3D conformal. And if you look at the results, IMRT helps with toxicity. And I need you guys to know this, okay? Every, and these are the major studies out there, right? Randomized studies. All IMRT does is it improves toxicity, both acute and late. And in head and neck is xerostomia, right? In prostate, it is both GI and GU. So IMRT really does reduce both acute and late GU toxicity. In breast, it reduces skin toxicity. And there's actually a small paper that shows that it probably will reduce long-term heart toxicity. And in cervix and endometrial, it also reduces GI and GU toxicity. But there is very little data that IMRT improves overall survival and local control, except for in nasopharynx cancer. So the big advantage of IMRT at this moment in time, from all the data we have, is it does reduce toxicity, which is so important for our patients that we're already curing. So pros, definitely decreases toxicity. We don't know if it makes a difference in overall survival or local control, except in nasopharyngeal cancers, okay? The cons, steep learning curve for both physicians and physicists. It is extremely time consuming, both, both physicians and physicists. Now AI is coming in. AI I think will help us a lot. And in fact, we're already using AI to help contour. But prior to AI, it would take 
me, and it still does, right? It'll take about an hour to two hours, if not more, for me to contour a, a patient. Now, we are starting to use contours using AI, especially in in-text cervix, that reduces the effort some, but it still takes about an hour for us to contour. So, I mean, contouring. When we move to IMRT, I spend close to three to four hours per patient. Now, I personally don't because I have residents who do it, but it does take close to three to four hours to do contouring. Prior to AI, where the normal tissues weren't even contoured, that would then even take longer because then we would have to contour all the normal tissues. Now, with AI, at least the normal tissues are already contoured. So all we have to do is contour the GTV, the CTV, but that still takes me contouring three to four hours, right? Then you got the planning. Then you got IMRT QA that has to be done prior to the patient starting her treatment, his or her treatment, okay? So you cannot start a case unless you've done IMRT QA, making sure the dose delivered, dose prescribed is the dose delivered before you put the patient on. And that has to be done at least the day before. So it is really time consuming. It takes a while to plan it, right? So both time consuming for the physicist as well as the physician. The other thing that's so important that just really, really, and I just can't tell you how important it is, is that daily IGRT. A patient who's on IMRT has to have daily IGRT. And whether it's KV or cone beam or whatever. And it's really important that IGRT is reviewed before the patient gets treated the next day. That's probably the most important thing. And we are required, a patient can't even get on the table until we reviewed the previous IGRT films. Key is with IMRT, unless you know what you're doing, you could miss. With a big 3D conformal plant, a field, you can't. It's hard to miss anything, including normal tissue, right? But it's also hard to miss a tumor. With IMRT, you have to be really, really careful on what you're treating, what you contour, and what you're treating. So that's a big, important step in using IMRT. And I think that's it. So I'm going to open it up to questions. I know I talked fast, a lot of pictures. What kind of questions can I answer? Dr. Jingren, that was, that was fantastic. I think a very, very nice overview of considerations both for and against intensely modulated radiation. Are there, are there any questions from the, from the group about any particular topics? I know it's kind of a broad overview, but any, any things that our people are, are thinking about as they're considering making this transition that are, they'd like to talk a bit more about? People are quiet. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, I have a small question about uh, your practice at your center. Just like the, in, we are drawing, a, a, you know, controlling a PTV. Similarly, are you considering the PRVs for organite risks as well because they are also moving? Yeah, no, 100%. That's what I was saying. That's where you're using your adaptive planning too, right? So yes, I mean, especially head and, head and neck and other areas, those organs at risk, if the tumor is regressing, if the tumor is moving, yes. I mean, it's really important to consider all of that. That's why like for stomach, we always treat with empty stomach so we know exactly where the tumor is and how much of the tumor uh, of the stomach we can save. When we're doing, you know, any kind of pancreatic, it's empty, again, empty bowels so that we know exactly what our normal tissue looks like. For prostate, I'm gonna say prostate, we treat with a full bladder and they have to do an enema the night, night before or the morning of, so that we do reduce the dose to the sigmoid and the rectum. Now in GYN, we're not doing, we're not looking at rectal filling as much, but in prostate, 100%, they do enemas every day before they get treated at our institution. And secondly, one of, uh, as you are mentioning, the adaptive radiotherapy, I think one of the challenges some people don't like the adaptive radiotherapy is that the microscopic disease is not getting, the, you know, the enough curable dose because if you shrink the USCTV after two weeks, 
if you you are really looking apparently the diseases decrease but microscopically it's becoming very hard to cover those areas so what are you no, your I, thoughts on that i 100 percent agree and that's why the data on adaptive radiation therapy is still really pending out there so i 100 percent agree with you and I think we just have to wait and see. I think the, the way how we adapt it though, I, we don't really change our microscopic disease, but if the tumor is regressing and the normal tissue is there, we will look at it, especially in head and neck. But I, again, data is unclear about adaptive radiation therapy. So I, there is still a concern that you are missing your microscopic disease and we don't quite know. So 100% agree with you there. Do we have any guidelines from S? Uh, no, because again, the data is not there yet. We it's have guidelines. Challenging with right, no, yeah, 100%, 100%. That's a new field that we're moving into that where there's no guidelines on when to do it. Dr. Gohar, just uh, to go back to your first question, were you, were you asking if PRVs are commonly utilized for, like for example, when she was showing us the, the cervical case where the bowel dropped into the field, was that was that kind of what you were questioning whether that you know it would be common to create a PRV for the bowel in that type of case? Yes, that's very true. We are facing the same challenge, especially for prostate and the cervix. Even when we do the simulation, you know, on the first day we can see the rectum is full with air, and then we need to do again the resim. Yes, yeah, so you know what we so like I said, our prostate patients have to do a fleet cinema, right? And if they're not prepped, they, they actually have to come back. For our GYN cases, we're actually using a rectal, we put a tube in the rectum and take that air out, or we have them empty it for the empty scan. So we do look at it. Yeah. I mean, that patient that I showed you, I wouldn't have not assimilated like that. We would definitely put a rectal tube in and taken that air out. But we do do, you know, again, with prostates, really very important what that rectum is looking like every day. So it is a standard for them to have the fleet cinema every day, right? It's very, um, very true. I'm not a medical doctor, I'm a physicist. Sometimes, you know, with the air filling in rectum, our treatment planning algorithms are not also incorporating those inhomogeneities yeah. as well. You're looking no, at the I, beautiful eyes of those lines and it's not. No, I agree. So that's up. why, yeah, I would have, that, that rectal case, I would have definitely, both at you, both rectal cases, right? Either you have to increase your PTV or you have to re-simulate. But then, you know, that what I was showing you on that cervix where that rectal, um, that rectal bubble came through, we actually took the patient off the table, right, and told her to go to the bathroom. And then we did another comb beam to make sure that that cervix was in the field. So, I mean, those, it's very relevant. I agree with you completely. And secondly, from your I experience at your center, are you teaching all the cervix in a prostate right from the phase one with IMRT or do you have the, just like we are for the phase one, mostly for prostate, we like to do the just for filling then. The yeah, no, so, yeah, so in our, in our center, because we've been doing IMRT for so long now, right? So you have to think about how much experience we've had, right? So that all our prostates period are treated with IMRT or IMPT because we use protons as well, but it is IMPT. So yes, all of our prostate cancers, no matter what, are treated with IMRT or VMAT, right? Because that's really what we're using, period. Our oh. intact cervixes, it's taken a while. I would say last year, I would tell you that 50-50, 50% of our intact cervixes were treated with four fields and 50% were treated with IMRT. I will say, tell you now, probably about 75 to 80% are treated with IMRT or VMAT and 20% aren't. And the only ones that we don't treat with IMRT for intact cervix is patients who do not have positive nodes. Anybody with positive nodes for intact cervix are treated with IMRT or VMAT. But again, realize we've been doing IMRT or VMAT for a long time. So we've gradually moved. So I agree with you, you've got to gradually move to it. So so two to three years ago, I would say most of our intact cervixes were treated with 3D conformal. We've slowly moved it to where more and more of our patients are treated with IMRT, but they are getting daily comb beams. They are getting daily KV. So we're looking at all of that on a regular basis. And we do daily ultrasounds 
as well because we have an ultrasound machines for all our prostates. The patients always get a daily ultrasound to see what the bladder filling is before they even get on the table so we're not wasting time on the table. As well as our GYM patients, if I'm treating with a full bladder, we will do a daily ultrasound scan before we even get them on the table to make sure that the bladder is close to what we want it to be. So we're not wasting time on the table. Awesome. Thank you so much for this explanation. Thanks. Other questions? Excuse me, as nobody's asking a question, let me ask you another question. Yeah. Are we also doing IMRT for the CSI cases? For the web stage cases? Oh, you know what? I think they are. This one I don't know, but I will find out for you. A little bit outside my area, but I'll, I will find out and I'll let you know. Okay? Because that okay. I, okay. don't, I think, yeah, I don't know. I have to find out. The question. I think yeah, because the reason I'm asking is I'm still reluctant to do IMRT because of the junction. We used to move the, the MLCs and the making the pinhead. That's fine. Yeah, I yeah, I have to find that out. So the so can I say something there real quick? I did show you that breast data. We are not using IMRT on our breast cases at all. Okay. And I think that's important because you have to realize in breast it is skin toxicity, but then you're also in, again, the reason why we're not doing it is one, you are increasing low dose to a lot of areas, including the other breast. So the one site that IMRT is not being used is breast cancer. So I think that's a really relevant question because it was interesting when I pulled up that table that it was breast cancer, right? But we do not use IMRT for breast cancer unless yes, it's the tangents, I think the tangents are the, the gold standard. But you can use the hybrid instead of using the fielding field. Nowadays, you can use open fields and the two IMRT that, that also works. Yeah, we use field and field. So I just said, just, you know, if you're asking what we do in my institution, that's probably the one um, site that we do not use IMRT at all, hardly, except for maybe some com complex chest wall cases. For intact breast, we rarely use IMRT for breast. So that's probably one of the only sites that we do not use IMRT. But most sites have moved to IMRT. I mean, GI, anal, and rectal are all IMRT now, basically, pretty much. Head and neck, of course, is IMRT. GYN, we're basically IMRT now, almost everything. Prostate has always been IMRT for the last, I think, eight to 10 years, as far as I know. And just to put a, a plug in for uh, next week, we'll be discussing pediatrics. And so we'll certainly cover CSI at that time, as well as some other common utilizations of IMRT for, for pediatric cancers. Yeah, thank you. And I was expecting the physics session today, but I think it has yes, been so our apologies. We had, we had to move, for anyone that's listening, we had to move the physics session to tomorrow at the same time the lecturer had, had an urgent conflict. So we tried to email all of the clinical coordinators at your, at your institutions. Hopefully they were able to get them, but I know unfortunately not all of them did. And some people may have tuned in today expecting to see physics. So tomorrow at the same time, we will have physics going and we'll, we'll resend out the schedule, the, uh, schedule again to everyone as well along with the instructions for how to upload cases for the, uh, the upcoming clinical sessions. Oh, yeah. Huh. And as a reminder, everyone, this uh, session was recorded. So if you tuned in a little bit late, that's okay. Within about two days, usually, we get these uploaded to uh, YouTube. It's the same uh, playlist link every time. So you should be able to review this lecture or any other about two days after they're given, usually. Any, any other questions? Well, in that case, Dr. Jane Green, I'd like to thank you yes, again. I think Go ahead. just last question, just yeah. last question. As, sorry, I don't know the name of the, the speaker. She was mentioning, I think, regarding the secondary cancers because of the low dose. Is there any data which is showing that really this IMRT because of the low dose is causing any kind of secondary cancers? So, no, there's not. And that's what I was saying. You know, there's been big, there was a big no. So that good question, that's what I was saying is there, there was some concern as of right now, there's no data that shows increase in secondary cancer because of IMRT, right? So we will see, but as of right now, there is not. Yeah, the, you know, the, the, the fact is it, it takes, you know, a, a minimum of five years and often more like 10 to 20 years to develop secondary malignancies. So I think a lot of the, the issue is just that IMRT hasn't been used in wide, wide experience for that long for us to start seeing that data. You know, certainly, there are modeling studies that suggest that a low-dose bath 
to the entire lung can increase the risk of lung cancer as opposed to just you know a portion, things that we consider when we're treating breasts, for example, with VMAT or things like that. But as Dr. Tingren said, the, the, the clinical evidence from it hasn't really come out yet. It is mostly theoretical. What I did, I did find interesting because I was, like I said, I was looking at pet and neck because I do treat only GYN, so I'm just, that's what, but I was looking at pet and neck and it was interesting to see this whole bath thing, right? And the fact that they are seeing increased toxicities and different toxicities, right? Especially fatigue, which was, I thought was really interesting with this bath concept. So they are seeing different toxicities with IMRT that they did not see when they were doing bigger fields. You know, the, again, and, I, I, and it's really important to note, IMRT does improve toxicity, but it has not shown, besides the nasopharynx, to really improve local control and overall survival yet, right? Besides nasopharynx. Nasopharynx is probably the only site that it has shown to improve overall survival and local control. But yeah, I mean, you're seeing different side effects with IMRT because of this bath concept. <laughs> Excellent. Well, and that, and that sounds like that will wrap it up for questions. So uh, Dr. Jingrid, I'd like to thank you so much for this great intro lecture to some clinical considerations to pros and cons for IMRT. We're really looking forward to Thursday at the same time. Uh, when we're going to kind of take a deeper dive into more practical contouring instructions for, uh, for GYN cancers. And, uh, and then following that, the, the session next week, we'll review some participant submitted cases to, to take a look at. So Again, I'd like to thank everyone for attending and have a great rest of your day. Thank you. We're like, so let's just start with, I'm gonna restart this dosing thing so that we can talk about it, right? So we do 45 to the microscopic notes. And as I was talking about this, you know, we're the 45 versus 50, right? And I do know in a lot of places in Africa, we're, they're going to 50, which makes a lot of sense right? Because you do have locally advanced cervix cancer. That's probably a little bit bigger than what we have, right? And as I talked about before, the disadvantage of going to 50 is that you are taking the rectum and the bladder to 50, as well as the sigmoid. So it really does limit how, you, how much dose you can give to your brachytherapy. So embrace does say you should not go past 48. You know, I don't know what the right answer is. And, and I, and I, Again, I'm not sure right or wrong is the answer because if you're using tandem and ring, going to 50 probably is the right answer because you're not getting enough dose to the parametrum no matter what, right? If you're using tandem and ovoids, I think going to 45 or 48 probably is the right answer because tandem and ovoids actually give more of a lateral throw off than the tandem and rings. So you're more limited in how you can load the ring and then the lateral throw off. But again, there's not a wrong or right answer, but knowing what, if you're going to 50, you are taking your bladder, rectum, and sigmoid to 50. So you have to know that. And that really does limit your brachytherapy dose, right? We always go to 45. And then we boost, right? Now, let's, so that we came back to now, let's talk about the parametrium, right? Whether you should boost the parametrium or not. Again, old data, always boost the parametrium. So this is wrong now. We don't ever boost the parametrium unless there's still residual parametrial disease at the time of the brachytherapy. If there's residual parametrial disease at the time of the brachytherapy, then you boost the parametrium. If there's not, there is no need to boost the parametrium. And that's really important. Okay. Now, lymph nodes. If you have positive lymph nodes, the doses between, and there again, this is a little bit of difference and you have to realize how to do this, right? Probably the minimum dose should be 60 to a grossly positive node, but it's also size dependent. If it's one CM or less, probably 56 is enough. If it's bigger than one CM, you probably do need 60. Now, Embrace does a concomitant boost of 2.2 to 55, okay, which gives you an equivalent of 60. So you don't replant. Our rule of thumb is we go at 200 a day to 50, and then we replant. Now, I don't think you need to if you have a 2CM or smaller lymph node. If you have a 2CM or smaller lymph node, you can 100% do 2.2 and go to 55 with no issues, okay? Because it's not going to regress enough that the normal tissues are going to come in. If you have something bigger than 2CMs, then you do need to resim. 
right? Because that note is going to shrink and you're going to get bowel in there. I mean, that's just my thought. Embrace doesn't do that. Embrace does go 2.2. There's nothing wrong with either or. We always do 50 and then we pre-plan. I think it really depends on the size of the note. But the goal is you really should try to get to 60 gray. And if the note is bigger than three to four CMs, you really try to need to get to 60, you know, between 65 and 66. Here's what we do. Positive notes in the periodic region, we go to 60 because you really are limited by your small bowel and your duodenum. In the pelvis, where there isn't as much small bowel and duodenum or anything else, we try to push those notes to 66. But it is in the pelvis, it's a combination of both, right? So you got to remember, it's a combination of external beam dose and brachytherapy dose to get that total dose to between 65 and 66. So you do need to add, hello? Okay, sorry. You do need to add your brachytherapy dose contribution, right? So just remember that. And that's what we always do, okay? I think that's pretty much for dosing. Key is, you know, 45, for micro, 45 to 50 for microscopic disease, and you really want to go above 60 for gross disease for nodes. Okay. Here's the post-op atlas, and so you can see where this is the post-op atlas that I was actually referring to. So that's the website, and we'll make sure you get it. So let's move to vulva, since we are going to be talking a little bit about vulva, and since we have time, we're going to do about a two-hour session. Probably it's not going to take two hours. We'll probably do an hour and a half session on this. But vulva, key, I think this is important. You guys need to know that you know, most of the vulva, most cancers occur in the labia. Two-thirds of the cases recur in the labia, but you will see um, cases occurring in any part of the um, vulva. Very important. Depth of invasion for vulva really does, does predict for lymph node metastases, right? So if you have less than one millimeter, you only have a 5% chance of having lymph node involvement. But if you go, look, if you go from one to three millimeters, the jump to invasion is five to 15. Greater than three millimeters, the chance of having nodal involvement is 25. Greater than five millimeters, 40%. So depth of invasion is important, but you can see really any invasion, the risk of having nodal involvement is really pretty high. Again, the size of the tumor. If tumor is greater than two CMs, you have greater than a 20% inguinal metastases rate, okay? Really important, the first ex extension is to the inguinal nodes, right? Know that, superficial and deep, and then it goes to the pelvic. For vulvar cancer, you really can't have pelvic node positively unless you have inguinal nodes, okay? So if you see a pelvic node, you're missing an inguinal node. Just remember that. And just like cervix, it's the same thing, right? So first echelon, superficial inguinal femoral. Second echelon, deep inguinal femoral, femoral, and then it's the pelvic nodes, okay? That's very, very important. And again, for consensus, this is, I mean, actually, I think there's even an updated of this, so this may be old, and I, I probably need to get you the updated of, of this, but again, we do have IMRT consensus for contouring and treatment of vulvar cancers, and this is the reference. And this is actually comes from the atlas. And we can go down this, and I actually have it step by step, so I was going to actually kind of go through that a little bit with you guys. But, you know, and in fact, let's just do that. But this is just shows you an example of how to contour. And this is straight from the atlas. But I'm going to go step by step. So give me a bit, and we'll go step by step. So IMRT for locally advanced vulvar cancer does work. In fact, that's the way to treat, just like for anus. So anus and vulvar cancer now, we are really doing IMRT and not the three fields. And there is data that shows that IMRT works very well without decreasing local control. But remember, for vulvar cancer, because it is a rare tumor, you're not going to get perspective data. So contouring the groins, you have to understand the anatomy. What's the anatomy, okay? What is it that we have to understand? The nodes are gonna be surrounding, they're gonna be anterior and medial to the vessels. That's the anatomy we need to know, right? Usually anterior and medial the, to the femoral and saphenous veins, okay? That's important. So 
<laughs> don't just contour the vessels. Again, it's the same thing as as is in the cervix or anything else, right? They're going to be here. The space right here is where the the nodes are going to be. So you're going to you need to know where the vessels are, but you got to cover that whole area, right? It's the bed. And I'll never forget I had a resident who just literally just contoured the the nodes. And you know, that's not what we right? They're going to be anterior and medial to the vein, the femoral vein and the saphus vein. You want to go to the psoas muscle, right? You want to go right behind the ves- psoas muscle. You want to go right behind the vessels, and then you want to go anterior medial, okay? If you, don't, you do not want to go into that crease, see that crease right there? You don't want to really cover that crease because then what that's going to do is cause skin toxicity, right? So you go right underneath. Okay, now, key. And I need you to know this, right? This is the CTV. This is not my PTV. What I'm contouring is my CTV. And as, as I said on Thursday, I think it's really important to do the CTV. And then you can do whatever PTV you want. Because then that CTV you know is accurate, right? So, again, here's your saphenous vein and your femoral, and fe- femoral veins and your muscles. So, you're going to go above the muscle. You don't need to include the muscle. You don't need to include this this muscle right here, right? You're going to go right behind the vessels. You're going to go anterior and medial, and you're going to go here. You're not going to cover that crease. That's because the nodes are going to occur right here, right? You're going to have PTV, and you could do, and it's up to you. I mean, if you do frog leg, you may want to do a CM PTV because it's not a stable position. If you keep the legs straight, you are going to treat more leg, and you, but you could do a 7-millimeter or a 5-millimeter PTV because the positioning is more, is more stable, okay? Just remember that. It's just, you know, the PTV can be whatever you want. So, again, so it's usually anterior medial to the femoral saphenous veins, as we say. It may lie along the tributaries of some distance from large vessels, right? So, here you got your superior epigastric vessel. And actually, if you go back, this is a node right here, right? See, look, it is medial and anterior to your vessels, right? Here's a node. And so, you want to make sure you cover that bed. Go to the muscle here, but you don't have to go down here. And this is the biggest mistake I see is the contour is going to this, right? You just need to go posterior to that vessel. You don't, there's not going to be a node here, right? So you don't need to go this far. What's the problem with going this far? Problem is then you're treating the femoral neck, which is where you're going to get your fractures, right? So you don't need to go this medial. Just go right underneath. You're going to have a little bit of PTV there anyway, and then go above your muscle and then go around because here is your nodes. These two are your nodes. Again, here's a node. See this? Right? So you want to cover that area. Cover that area. Go to the muscle. Go to the muscle. Go right behind to the vessel, but don't, you don't need to go here. Go right behind the vessel and cover that area. Those are your nodes right there, and here's another node. But you can see if you go this whole area, you're covering the area that the nodes are going to be. As you go further down, again, you can see this is actually a large, probably obturator node right here. So as you go lower down, again, you're still in the inguinal area, right? Now, here's an obturator, so you're not coming to the obturator. Here's a big inguinal slash obturator, but it's probably inguinal, right? So you want to cover this area right here. You can see, go Go to the muscle, go down, but you've got to cover this obturator space. That's important. We talked about this, right? Got to cover that obturator space. So contouring the vulva, and I think this is, for me, the hardest thing to do. And, and you have to know what to treat, okay? So what, and I, we don't use fiducials, so I know the slice us use fiducials. We don't. We definitely do, do make sure we need to know how much of the vagina is involved. You also need to know if you need to treat the mons or not, okay? If you don't have an anterior lesion, you don't need to treat the mons. This is actually a lady who had her mons treated, and you can see the swelling. The mons doesn't have to be treated unless you have a very locally advanced tumor, okay? That's really important to, to know. Well, what do I do? I usually wire. I wire the lesion. So you can use stickers. You can use little things. But I usually wire the lesion in the um, simulator, so I know exactly where the um, lesion is. I will fuse my CT. I will fuse my MRI to make sure I can see the lesion. But key is you got to wire the lesion on the CT because there's parts that you're never going to see, right? 
You also 100% have to do a good exam so you know how much of the vagina to treat. That's really important. If there's no vaginal involvement, then you need to treat, just treat the distal two-thirds of, of two or three cm's of the vagina. If there's vaginal involvement, you're going to have to treat the entire vagina. So you have to know how much of the vagina is involved. Key is you want to avoid areas where the, you don't need to treat. So you don't want to treat these thighs, right? So you got to, when you're contouring, make sure you, the thighs are not included because even though you're going to have a little bit of PTV to cover the thighs, that's where the skin reactions are going to happen. That's where you may get swelling of the of um, the legs. So don't treat the thighs if you don't need to treat, treat the th thighs. Don't treat the mons if you don't need to treat the mons. But there are definitely air at times when you do need to treat the mons, and that's where that contouring atlas will really help you. So just, you know, this is just an example of why IMRT works, right? So, and I think I've showed this one time out before, right? This is a lady that got full APPA field, right? You can see where the thighs were treated, the mons was treated, and, you know, just the skin reaction. This is a lady who got IMRT. You can look at her thighs and look at her mons. You know, it's so much prettier. But it also, this causes major toxicity like skin irritation and itching. And, I mean, there's a lot of other things just not just cosmetics. So it's really important to try to avoid as much of the normal tissue as possible, especially the anus. So here's just an example of what we do. Like I said, I always, we, I put markers on my lesion. I will put a marker at the anus and I will put a marker at the clitoris if you want, right? And then this is my GTV and this is my CTV. So this is the whole vulva, but you can see I'm not treating all the way out here if I don't need to. So this is my lesion. This lesion went into the vagina. So you can see where I am treating the vagina and then I have more CTV. So this is my GTV right here in the red. This would be my CTV. So GTV vulva, which will get a higher dose, CTV vulva, GTV vagina, CTV vagina. Okay, so this is important to know how much of the vagina to treat. And I think that's it. So that's the end of this. And what I'm going to do is actually show you real contouring. So I'm moving this here. So can everybody see my, con my um, contouring station? Jonathan, can you see? Because yes. I can't hear. Yes, I, yes, okay, I can. It looks great. Thanks. Okay, great. Okay. All right. So, you guys, the one thing I didn't do in this case is this is a post-op case, and we don't have the fusion because I was trying I was trying to get this, and I'm, I hope you can hear me because I'm going to try to put you on speaker. So, I wanted to show you, like, real contrary, and I uh, – so, what we would normally do is have an empty and full – Scan. And I do apologize that what we couldn't get done when he was fusing this is he didn't, because I had to get it de-identified. And so when he was trying to do that, he didn't put my empty in. So, but I, but again, but I still will show you what I'm, what we're talking about. So I want to show you. So what I'm going to take off here first is all the PTBs. Okay. So, and I'm going to, well, let's, let's, start actually from the beginning. Let's get from the top. So this is a lady who is a post-op endometrium with positive residual node. And so you can see here, and I'm going to make this bigger. Okay. So we're going to go from the top. And again, this is just a highlight things that we've talked about. And let me know if the window leveling is, hey, Jonathan, just let me know if the window leveling is not good. Cause oh, I think it looks fine. Thanks. It looks okay. Okay, yeah. the other option yeah. is, okay. So we're gonna start from the top. So this is a lady with endometrial cancer who actually has positive nodes. So she's a 3C2. So we're going down. And remember what we talked about when I said we were talking about, where to treat and how to treat and what we're treating, right? So remember, we're not going to include the symphonous, the vein, the, I'm um, sorry, not the symphonous vein because we're not in the inguinal area. But we're not going to include this vein higher up. So as you can see, this is my CTV, okay? So as we go down, on the left side, I'm going to start catching this area because the nodes are going to be positive on this left side. But look, I'm not including that vein here because I'm like, as for GYN, I'm not going to have nodes out there, okay? So as I go down, I'm more, bigger, I'm more generous on the left, not including the vein here, okay? So as I go down, 
Now, as, I, as we go further towards now, we're getting towards the kidneys, I'm going to start including the vein. But you can see where that node would be positive. And this is where you really need to be generous on that left side. So this is actually my PTD. So I'm going to take my PTD off, and I'm going to show you where the node is. But the positive node, so see, that's a positive node, right? So you can see where it really is right by the renal vessels, and it's really on that left side. So here is the node. Now you can see as I'm catching that vein. Now I'm catching that vein. Now I'm going more to that left, right? I'm going to muscle to muscle. So here, but this is my CTV, you guys. Okay, so you can see I really am hugging those vessels, right? CTV. And if you look at my PTV, I'm going to show you that PTV. Here's my PTV. Okay, so I do a seven millimeter chest expansion for the PTV. Now for this, I actually, and if I'm gonna put it back on, we only do a five millimeter expansion on my GTV, but I'm doing daily KVs. And we're gonna be looking, and I do KV both for the pelvis and for the upper um, abdomen every day. So that I know that it's actually accurate. If you're not, then you have gotta make a higher PTV. Okay, so I'm going to take this off again because I think the PTV confuses. But as you can see, as we go down, and again, and maybe cheating a little here, but you don't want to go into the bone, you can see I go right to the muscle. And I really am just covering the vessels. See that? Just covering the vessels. And there's my GTV. And we're going down. Again, you can see, just. I, you know, it really isn't treating any of my, I'm not co countering the, the bowel. Now, your PTV, make it as generous as you want. And then that all depends on how much daily imaging or what type of daily imaging you have on what your PTV is. But your CTV should be as accurate as possible. Okay, so here, now we're going to go and catch the ureter. So we're going to come in, now we're catching the ureter, we're covering the vessels, two CMs above my, for the, my sacral, we're going down. I get two CMs right here, between two to three CMs, now I got the ureter in. But you can see, I'm really trying to get off my bowel. There's a little bit of bowel, I probably should have made this a little bit tighter, but this is okay too. But you can see though, I'm really trying to avoid the bowel in my CTV. But look, You've got to make sure you got two to three CMs in that, and cover that vessel, okay? As we're going down, here comes my another GTV node. And I, and, and you know, like I said, I'm sorry that I didn't have this fuse, but usually we have, so we have this, we have the CT fuse and we have the PET fuse if we have a fusion, okay? So this is an endometrium, had no, so let's look at this for a minute. I'm going to go to my sagittal. Okay, I want you to see this because this is important. you got to look at both your sagittal and your axial. So this was an endometrium, right? And what did I tell you about endometrium? For endometrium, I go down to S2. So you can see I'm going down to S2, okay? So if we go back up, and I'm going to go back up, so here's S2, right? And then as I go further down, I'm getting off the sacrum. Right, S2, I start moving away from the sacrum, okay? Very important. Now, this is my full scan, and I, like I said, I do apologize that I don't have the empty scan on here, and I am going to take the bowel space away so that you're not confused. So as we're going down, you can see where I'm coming out, and I probably, in this case, I probably should have come out even a little bit more, and I want you guys to see this, because. Again, now I'm looking at it more carefully with y'all, right? See this? This is parametrium right here. So actually, if I would have to, and I'm, I, if I had to redo this, I would probably. <laughs> so again, this is my fault, right? And this is, I would probably go out here and have covered that space right there, because that's parametrial node, okay? As we go down, this probably should, probably should go a little bit more out here because we're missing some parametrium, but you can see here we did. But what I did, though, is here, and, and this is why it's okay, is here is my, we're starting my vaginal ITV because really the vagina, so I'm probably a little bit higher up, and let's look at this. I'm probably a little bit higher up. I'm going to move this up. Sorry, because I want to show you this, because this is important. Again, you have to look at your sagittal, right? You can see where my vaginal ITV probably starts, because this is probably the true top of the vagina right here. 
But my vaginal ITV is a little bit higher, and it's probably because I had my empty and, and I, it is. It's because I have my empty and full fused. So this includes both the empty and the full. But it also will include my parametrium, which that's important. You got to make sure you're covering. So here's the parametrium, and here's the parametrium, right? So it is probably a little bit higher than the true vagina, but not by much. So as you go down, so here's really the vagina starting to come in, right? Here's the vagina, right? But the reason why I know this is my empty and full fuse, see, look how much I'm going down and I'm including the rectum and I'm including, so here's the vagina right here, including all of this. And I'm going into the bladder, because so this was my empty and full fused, okay? So you can see how much I actually do go into that bladder and I'm covering the rectum. And I'm not going into the rectum because it's going to change, right? So you can see that's my ITV. That's my, my vaginal ITV, and I will add a PTV to it. Maybe I will add a PTV to it. So here's my PTV. So I have a 7-millimeter PTV to my vaginal ITV. But I'm only going to 45 gray. So, yeah, I am treating all that rectum, but I'm only going to 45 gray, okay? So that's important. And as you can see, now this is where we do a little bit different. We do go to the, to the bottom of the symphysis. So you can see that's where my vaginal ITV ends. I and mean, we probably went a little bit lower than I probably, you probably should. I probably would have, should have taken a slice or two off, right? But we do get a mid-symphysis on this. So if you put the PTV, and I'm just going to show you the coronal, you can see, look at this. And so you can see where that's my PTV. You can see how it's covering, and if you look at the PTV, it really does give you the transverse processes that we used to talk about, right? But I think it's the ITV that I really, really wanted you to see. Now, I'm going to show you another case. Dr. Jinger, we had a question from one of the participants. They were asking, is it always necessary to contour the periortic nodes? And I was, I had said that generally we only do it when there's a high risk, such as a, a node that's involved in the common iliacs or in the pelvis. Could you elaborate on that a little bit when you yeah, contour so, the PAs? Yeah, so remember we talked about this. In this lady's case, she actually, if you saw, she did have positive node, right? Mm -hmm. So she had a positive periodic node. So let's, so two different things. So let's, uh, let's talk about when you cover the periodics. In cervix cancer, if you have positive common iliac node, you want to cover the periodics. If you have positive periodic nodes, you're going to cover the periodics, right? For endometrial cancer, I think it varies on when you're going to cover the periodics. In this lady's case, it was a post-op endometrium, and there was, and she had a lot of positive sentinel nodes. So we do sentinel nodes on our endometrium. So I did, we did a post-op CT, and she had those positive residual nodes. So we were treating the periodics. Does that make sense? So if you have, for cervix, if you have positive common iliac nodes, or if you have multiple positive pelvic nodes, I would treat the periodics, okay? Endometrium, it varies on what you see. Right. Does it, does it, is it impacted heavily by location of the tumor? For example, fundal tumors, you're more likely to, to cover periodics? Right. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, thanks. Yes. Yeah. All right. So I'm going to show you a intact cervix, okay? So this is it, and what and the key is in this case, I really want to show you this. And again, I do apologize because I did talk to you about how I fuse empty and full, right? And so my empty and full is not fused. But in this case, my empty and full probably didn't work because of how full. Look at this. You guys, so I want you to see this because this is, again, things, and what I'm trying to show you is mistakes that I do wrong or mistakes that you could do wrong, right? So this lady really ended up having such a full bladder that if I did empty and full, it was such a change that we decided that we were only going to treat her with the full bladder. So what I'm doing is I'm actually doing daily comb beams on her to make sure that the bladder stays pretty consistent and then that I, so that I have the uterus in the field, okay? So if you do have, and I see the advantage of this, right? What is the advantage of this? Can you see? It's pushing all my bowel out of the field, right? So the big advantage of having such a full bladder is that it pushes all my bowel out of the field, right? So I think you have to decide 
And in this case, because she ended up, and this just ended up, this was my first scan and it was so full that I decided that this was the best way of doing this. So I, do, I am doing a daily CT on her just to make sure that I have the uterus in the field. But what I do want to show you is even then, and I think this is the most important thing, even then, if, you, if I go down, can you see the purple? I don't know if you guys can see the purple. Well, I'm going to take the purple away, and I'm going to take this away. Okay, so this is my uterus. Okay, what I want to show you is how generous I am with the uterus, okay? So you can see, yes, it's covering the uterus, and it says I go down, even then, it's pretty generous, even though I am going to treat just with the full bladder. Going down, as we go down, that's my uterus, and you can see I am very generous with this uterus, even though I am going to be treating with a full bladder. And then if I put my PTV on, sorry, which is a purple, you can see it's actually very generous, right? It is treating almost all the bladder, but I am only going to go to 45. So you could, and a lot of people would, if you look at my sagittal, here's my ITV. Right? So, I, because I don't think this lady will ever get it go a little bit further out. If you were really truly doing daily comb beans, you could make this tighter and made your PTV even tighter so you're not treating so much of the bladder, okay? It is, all depends on what, how you think it reliable. I didn't think she was going to get this full so I did go, I was a little bit more generous on my ITV anteriorly, as you can see right here. And my PTV is seven millimeters from that. But it is really a question, I mean, and I've seen a lot of people actually go much tighter anteriorly, right? Because they're, they're going to use their comb beam. And if the bladder is not this full, they'll take the patient off the table, let her continue to fill up, and then do it again. Okay. I, let, I, I did allow a little bit of leeway. So if she's not so full, the bladder's going to fall anteriorly. So I did give a little bit of margin, but I'm still sparing a lot of that bladder if you look sagittally. So see, a lot of that bladder is still being spared. I'm going very fast. I just, so please ask questions. I mean, I think the key, what I really want to show you is that we don't carve the rectum, right? We don't as we're going down, I don't carve off the rectum. I treat the rectum because I am only going to go to 45. So I still have room to come back and treat this lady with my brachytherapy. And the other thing I want to show you is, look, I am covering that obturator space that we keep talking about. You've got to cover that obturator space. That obturator space is so important in cervix cancer. Look at what her nose was positive in the obturator area, right? So I'm, you have to cover that space. That space is so, so important. These are positive notes that I did fuse the PET and the CT, which I'm sorry I couldn't show you, but that's how we got those contoured. But you can see them very clearly even in that. So I did treat her to the top of her renal vessels because she had high common iliacs. So I, I did treat her up to the top of the renal vessels on her. So you can see I go all the way to the top of the renal vessels, which come in right here. So that's where I went because she had high commons. And we do contour the duodenum to make sure that, you know, we look at our duodenal dose. And I can just show you real quick. Oh, no, I don't think I have a plan on her. So, all right, I'm going to go to the last one, which is the vulva. Dr. Jingren, that was great. Could I ask you a quick question? Uh, just sure. for many, many of these folks who uh, may be, you know, embarking on, on IMRT planning yeah. for patients, do you, do you typically recommend that people start with, you know, post-op patients and kind of feel like they've mastered that before moving to intact cervix? Or... Yes. Okay. Yes. 100%. Yeah. 100%. I mean, and that's how we started. We started off with it being intact cervix, I mean, I mean post-op, and then we moved to vulva, and then we move to intact cervix. I mean, our intact cervix really was our last one that we moved to. All right. 
So just the last thing that I'm going to show you is Fulva, because I'm sure that you guys are done with GYN. Okay, so let's show you vulva. So let me tell you about this case so that you know what about, so this is actually a post-op case. So this is not a um, gross disease. She actually has close margins and she has a positive sentinel node on the left. Everything else is negative. Because she has a positive sentinel node, we are taking, okay, because she has a positive groin node, we are treating the pelvis to 45, even though there are no nodes that are positive. So you can see, remember I talked to you about how vulva doesn't usually go to the sacral node, so we're not covering the sacral nodes in this case. So you can see I am not covering the sacral nodes at all, right? I am turning, treating just the internal and, inter and external iliacs, going down, covering my obturator space, um, nodes, right? So that would be my obturator space here as you can see, and then we're coming to my inguinal contour. So here's my endocal, and this is actually not a positive node. You can see, look, it has a fatty hilum. So I'm coming up and I'm gonna include my inguinal, so here's my, so this is the note bed that got dissected. They did not dissect the right side, and they didn't really dissect, they only took the sentinel nodes, right? So as you can see, I'm covering, now we're coming up and we're gonna include the inguinal bed. So here's the inguinal bed. As you can see, I just go to the muscle and I go anterior. I'm not covering extra tissue. See, look, just going right behind the vessels. See that? And going right out to the muscle and just covering that area, just covering the muscle, going out. Again, see that this? this is the bed. All I'm doing is just covering this area. I'm not, so she did not have extra capsular extension. She had microscopic disease in the sentinel nodes. We did do a post-op CT that was negative. So I'm not going to the creases. I'm not chasing the scar. Only time that you chase a scar is if there's extra nodal extension in the lymph node. If there's no extra nodal extension in the lymph node, you do not need to treat that scar, okay, for post-op cases. But you can see, look, I'm going to the, I'm right behind the vessels, going to the muscle, and just covering the bed where the node could be positive. Look at this. This is like normal negative, right? Behind the vessels, covering that bed, away from this crease. And in this case, like I said, I am not chasing that scar because she did not have extra capsular extension. So you can see this. I'm not treating extra tissue. I'm not treating her mons because her disease is lower down. Now, her disease was deep. And it didn't involve the vagina, but it did go in. So we are treating the vagina as my CTV. So here's my vaginal CTV coming in. And then this is the tumor bed that, by scar that we felt was there, even though you couldn't see it. But it was involving close to the clitoris. So here's the clitoris. I'm including, including the clitoris in my vulva CTV. So this is my vulva CTV. And here's my, and this is going to be my tumor bed that we contour by the wire that I put in, and you're going to see that in a minute. But here's the clitoris. Look, I'm covering the clitoris, but I'm not covering the mons because the clitoris was not involved. Now, if the clitoris was involved, I would probably go more anterior, right? But the clitoris wasn't involved, so I'm not covering all of this. That's, to see that? I'm not covering now. As we go down, we're going to go into the vulva, and you can see I go more lateral. I did put wire on the scar, and that's what you're seeing there. That's the wire and a BB on the scar. So here's my tumor bed, and here's the vulva. You see where, but you have to be careful. You know, if it's a very advanced case, you're going to cover all of this. But in this case, it was post-op, all taken out, close margins. I'm not going to cover the mons in this case. Spare a lot of tissue. Important. I want you to see is, what we did is you don't take the inguinals past that trochanter. And I know, I know you can't see this. Well, I would have to, sorry. Let me see if I can do this. So if you look, and I want to just see where I, well, I'm going to show you something, where I stop my inguinals, right? So if you look on it's the coronal, coronal right here, my inguinals stop right there. See, I went right to my trochanter and I stopped. I don't go lower because otherwise you're treating the legs. All right, we went through a lot. What kind of questions can I answer? And I'm going to stop sharing so I can see you guys.
from a participant about you know levels of proctitis when we're when we're treating the whole rectum in these scenarios. So I was kind of just explaining that it, you know expected to be lower with IMRT than four field pelvis, but it is also totally dependent on dose, right? Okay, so proctitis is really much higher in intact cervix, and it's really related to your brachytherapy dose, right? So, you know, 45 to 50 to the rectum is okay. But then you have to start looking, and actually, if you look at embrace data, they really now are saying that you should keep the 2cc of the rectum less than 65 to reduce grade 2 proctitis. So, you know, it really is correlated with more your rectal dose to your, your brachytherapy dose, unless you're taking something closer to 66. Then, you're, you know, then your, rect your proctitis dose may be higher. But if you look at Embrace, and Embrace has some great data, but it's, it really is now recommending, if you can, to reduce um, grade 2 or lower proctitis rates, you really need to keep the 2cc rectum less than 65. Excellent. Any, any questions from anyone else? Maybe while we're waiting for people to ask, I'll, I'll throw another one in, which is that when you're con contouring inguinal nodes and for, for vulvar cancer, or even sort of could apply for other subsites in the area, do, do you tend to strictly apply the expansions from the ASTRO consensus guidelines, which I think are from Barry Wall's publication, or do you kind of go more based on the, the, the borders, the anatomic borders, and then, you know, anteromedially, just whatever looks like a, a generous enough region? Yeah, so my PTV is usually seven millimeters to a CM on the inguinals, depending on how big or small the patient is. If the patient's small, the seven millimeter PTV is enough. If the patient's obese, I may do a CM, just because um, the positioning can be off a lot on a bigger patient. But for the CTV expansions, I know that they recommend like three and a half centimeters, you know, anterior yeah, medially. Yeah. I know. But did you see how? So we don't do that, right? Okay. I'm not a fan of that. We. We really contour that bed. If you saw it, that's what we do. And if you saw my slides, that's how we do it. Mm -hmm. We don't expand. We really contour the bed. Okay. So we look at it and we contour that bed. Does that make sense? Yes, it does. Thank you. Okay. Yeah, I'm, I mean, I'm not, a, we're not a fans of the expansion thing because I don't think it's equal in everybody, right? You've got to look at the patient. Mm -hmm. So you've got to, so we always contour a CTV. I mean, we don't do expansions. It, you contour the CTV like I showed it on my vulvar patient and like I showed it on the slides. That's how we contour it. And that's what we say on the atlas too. Mm -hmm. So it's not an expansion on the atlas, which Barrowell was also an author of. Okay. We have another question. What is the maximum dose you allow on bowel loops? Uh, I assume they mean small bowel. Uh, yeah. Yeah, so you know what? We don't look at that. I mean, that's a good question. We don't look at that because we're hoping that bowel loops move. Right, and so I know I get all these, I mean, everybody's, because in GI, they're very careful about what the bowel dose is. We assume bowel loops move, right? So we don't believe in maximum dose, but I'm gonna tell you what we do look at is that if you're treating the periodics, and we have a paper, and it's a little bit higher than what GI shows, but what we do is two cc's, uh, the duodenum should be less than 60, 15 cc's of the duodenum should be less than 55, and we use that as our correlate for small bowel doses, because whatever the duodenum is getting is what your uh, small bowel is getting. But in the pelvis, you got to assume your sigmoid and all of that is moving, but we really don't push the sigmoid past that 65, right? But we really don't look so hard on the maximum dose, because you're hoping that bowel is moving, right? So... It's really hard. We really don't look at maximum dose. We try to minimize it as much as possible, but a point dose is hard to mean anything, right? That's where a maximum dose is hard if it's a point dose. Excellent. Any any other questions? Uh, what protocol do you follow for on-treatment imaging? Okay, good I, question. I yeah, no, good question. So I'm going to be honest with you. I think for intact cervix, you should do daily comb beams. I mean, I'm, I'm just going to be honest about it. I think that's the only way you're going to know for sure that the uterus is always in the field. For post-op, we do daily KV. But again, we also do daily bladder scans to make sure that the bladder volume is 10 to 15% of what it should be before we even put them on the table. So then daily KV works. If you have to decide what you have and what's reliable, 
I mean, that's where, you know, that's why we do an ITV, right? So daily KV probably is enough for post-op. Daily KV is probably enough for vulva, but I would add a comb beam once a week for vulva just to make sure that the patient's really setting up. And, you know, so you're, you're catching the rotation, especially if you're going to do frog leg. But intact cervix, I'm going to say I would do daily comb beam. I, you, it just would make you feel better to look at, so I would do daily KV and then daily comb beam. So daily KV to make sure that the nodal structures are all good, the comb beam to make sure that the uterus is in the field. It's a lot, I know. We have another question. What are your allowed margins of nodal CTVs over bowel loops? Is, in, is there any, do you have no. a distance that you don't allow? It's more dose-based, yeah. No, we do seven millimeters in dosing, you know, right? That's why the paradigms, we don't go past, you know, if you have a paradigm GTV, we don't usually go past 60, but we really look at our duodenal dose. All right. It doesn't appear that we have any more questions. So I, I would like to thank you so much, Dr. Jane Green, for this, you know, this additional session. I think being able to cover vulva and go through some contours in particular was really, really helpful. So tomorrow for everyone.